And you, and you, and you, and you were there. Some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. Hey, Brian. Greetings. How are you? Howdy, how are you? I'm doing well. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> and we've returned. Welcome to Dream Idiots. Um, where should we start? You can get a hold of us at dreamidiotspodcast at gmail.com on email. And our website is, what's our website, Brian? Uh, the website is just dreamidiots.com. Uh, All right. So uh, the various, I mean, all the episodes are, are there. And by the time this goes out, we should be on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify, and perhaps others. Um, and we're, we you know, happily take feedback, input, criticism, complaints, insults, you know, whatever you got. <laughs> whatever you got. We'll take it. Um, I, I go first, right? You're up first. I'm up first. So, uh, you ever taken a cross country trip, Brian, in a car? Uh, I've taken some long road trips. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call them a cross country, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So have I. I've done a few too. Uh, early continental trips. By early, I mean early 20th century. You couldn't just, you know, throw your smartphone in the car. You had to take a whole lot of stuff. You had to take extra food and water, extra fuel, oil, tools. Sometimes you would have to take axes and rope <laughs> to clear to clear roadways, several extra tires, probably belts and all kinds of stuff you'd need to take. The first continental trip via car that we know of was done in 1903 by a fellow by the name of Horatio Nelson Jackson, his buddy Sewell Crocker, and Bud, a bulldog pup. And uh, I won't say much more about it, but you can check out an excellent documentary by a, a fellow by the name of somebody named Ken Burns did a 2003 documentary called Horatio's drive. And I highly recommend that, that uh, documentary. It is tangentially related to what I'm about to tell you, because I'm looking at the era afterwards where road conditions started to improve traffic increased uh, roads became more and more drivable. And of course, by the fifties, we've got the interstate highway system. Now, what else do we need along highways? But we need advertising, which brings me to Burma Shave signs. So this is a history of Burma Shave, an ad campaign. Excellent. And we've talked about this. You, you have kind of a fascination with Burma Shave signs as well. And I've always, I've always kind of wondered, what the hell exactly is Burma Shave? Uh, I knew it had something to do with shaving. It was a brushless shaving cream. Normally, you would have to take your uh, shaving cream and whip it up with your with in the mug with your brush lather right. it on your face and probably get out that straight razor to, to shave your face but it was a brushless shaving cream that came in a tube or a jar it was introduced in 1925 by the Burma Vita company of Minneapolis Minnesota and it claimed to have ingredients from the Malay Peninsula Malay Peninsula including Burma so that's where it gets the name from Burma shave um, what were these signs well Burma shave signs were actually a series of signs, six signs to each little ad, if you will, that had verse on them. They first appeared in Lakeville, Minnesota on U.S. Highway 65 in 1926. They went national in 46 of the 48 contiguous United States, the exceptions of Nevada, because there wasn't enough traffic, and Massachusetts, because it was far too expensive and there was too much roadside uh, foliage they'd have to get rid of. So mm. you wouldn't find any in Massachusetts or Nevada. These signs were 36 inches long, about 10 inches high, and they were on stakes spaced out across the road where you could read them in order. Typically, when you think of a Burma shaved sign, you think of the white text on a red background. Well, early on, they also had a bl an orange, a black text on an orange background, but that one didn't last too long. And South Dakota had its own special white text on blue because there was a state law that reserved red signs for emergencies only. Right. So Burma Shave had to resort to white on blue. Uh, the Burma Shave Company was sold to Philip Morris in 1963 and signs were removed. Part of this was due to the fact that Philip's Morris had legal advice saying, hey, maybe it's not a good idea to distract people with, with ads right. like that, as clever <laughs> as they are, because this is widely regarded to be one of the best ad campaigns ever, and probably the best ad outdoor advertising ever. 
So there was a legal legal problem. And then as you get into the 1950s, you move from 30 to 35 miles per hour of a 20s, 30s automobile to 50 miles per hour and above. So if you wanted to keep this campaign up, you would have to basically uproot all the signs and space them further apart along the road. So you'd be right, able to make read them, them bigger too, right? Right, and make them bigger. Um, so rather than do that, they folded the ad campaign and, and they vanished uh, by 63. Now, these little verses, these little tags, they would typically be six lines long, and the last line would always be the product name, Burmashave. There are a couple of exceptions to this, and we'll get to those in a moment. But the themes of the signs might include things like the product's characteristics, the value of using it. They might be romantic in nature or humorous. A lot of them are very funny. They might concentrate on the war effort once we get into World War II. And driving safety was a big theme as well. There were over, just guess, how many different verses do you think there were in the 1927 to 1963? Oh, geez. Uh, 500? Very close. 600 different verses adorned America's highways with Burma shave signs. I'm going to read you every single verse, starting with number one. No, I'm kidding. I do have quite a few to read to you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out three, and then I'm going to read another one, and I'm going to have you fill in line five. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay. You ready? All right. So I'm just going to use, I, I, I will tell you the general theme of it. And I'll give you, I'll start off with three. One is from 1930. This is once was a man from Nantucket. No, that's no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, from 1930, here's a product example. And I'm going to hold up my finger so you can see them. So you can see what line I'm on. Okay. Shaving brushes. You'll soon see them way down east in some museum Burma shave so soon they will make shaving brushes obsolete because you don't need to use them. from 1933 a romance sign he played a sax had no bo but his whiskers scratched so she let him go Burma shave from 1935 i just joined the young man said a nudist camp is my face red? No, I use Burma shave. From 1937. See if you can guess what the fifth line is, Brian. You know the sixth <laughs> line is going to be Burma shave. Right. So, right. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm going to be terrible at this game, but I'll try. If harmony is what you crave, then get a... I have no idea. <laughs> Tuba. A oh, God. get a tuba Burma shave <laughs> you puns uh, from 1939 and I'll, I'll read this one out from here's a safety example hardly a driver is now alive who passed on hills at 75 Burma shave now here's an example of one that doesn't end in the words Burma shave see if you can guess what the sixth line is Okay. If you don't know whose signs these are, you can't have It's not Burma shave, a driving car. No. Very close. You can't have driven very far. <laughs> driven you very don't know far. who signed these yeah. are. I, I knew the rhyme was going to be all, you know, AR. Okay. Okay, here's another one from 42, which is the war effort. Uh, buying war bonds means money lent, so they don't cost you one red cent. Burma shave. Okay, buy war bonds, support the war effort. Okay, Brian, you're up. Uh, <laughs> we're looking for line five. Mm -hmm. So you know line six is, again, the product name. From 1947, here's a holiday jingle. Santa's whiskers need no trimming he kisses kids go ahead <laughs> kisses kids Santa's while, he, whiskers. while he's while he's grinning no that would be good he kisses kids not the women Burma oh. shave and women on the sign is actually spelled w-i-m-m-i-n -M -M -I -N. yeah <laughs> right. yeah <laughs> okay, here's another one for you. Uh, okay, here's here's one from here's a safety one from 1948. 
Little Bo Peep has lost her Jeep. It struck a truck when she fell asleep. Burma shave. That's one of the darker ones. Right, right. You're going to hate this one, and you got to finish this one. <clears throat> From 1948, another safety sign. At school zones, heat instructions. Protect our little... Protect our little oh, for, no, minions. Distra- uh, no, I, I, can't, I can't think of any other word that rhymes with instruction. You, you're going to, I'm such a bastard. <laughs> At school zones, heat instructions protect our little tax deductions. Oh, fuck. Shave. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another one that doesn't end with Burma Shave from 1949. Just this once. And just for fun, we'll let you finish what we've begun. And then the sixth sign is just question marks, just a row of questions. Uh, okay. So fill in the blank. Okay. You only got two more, Brian. I got five more examples, but you only have two more you have to finish. Okay. Um, from 1960, safety sign. On curves ahead, remember, Sonny, that rabbit's foot didn't save Any money. Didn't save the bunny. No. Burma shave. Like I said, dark. Okay. Um, From 1951, and this will be the last play along for you. This is a safety one as well. Proper distance to him was bunk. They pulled him out. Of his trunk. Of some guy's trunk, Burma shave, because he was tailgating. Um, they might include meta humor, like from 1953, that said, we're widely read and often quoted, but it's shaves, not signs for which we're noted, Burma shave. Um, and then just two last ones, both of these humor, one from 59. This might be my all-time favorite sign. He lit a match to, te- to check the tank. That's why they call him Skinless Frank, Burma shave. That's pretty good. <laughs> And then they had a fascination with Henry VIII for some reason. He crops up more than once in the signs from 1960. That's weird. Well, you know, I, th- I think it's, yeah, there's this kind of underlying, um, yeah, I don't know, misogyny going on in some of these so- <laughs> signs. But <laughs> right. from 1960, uh, here's Henry VIII sure had trouble, short term wives, long term stubble, Burma shave. <laughs> so some of them are thinkers. Um, there were also a few bobtail jingles, and I didn't know about these till I reread uh, the excellent book, The Verse by the Side of the Road, which I'd not read for many years, just going through it. There were bobtail jingles, and these first appeared in 1939 on approaches to major cities where you had less room to work with. So these were just two signs, and the second sign would always say Burma Shave, so you had to put something on that first sign just to get their attention. For example, and in this book I just mentioned, they'd list them all. But you might have a sign that says, covers a multitude of chins. And the second sign would just say, Burma shave. Instead of multitude of sins, multitude of chins. Burma shave. Right. And they call those bobtails. Um, there are apparently recreated signs along Arizona State Highway 66, which is part of the old Route 66. And there are various museums across the country which have actual signs. Um, I recently visited the Forney Museum of Transportation here in Denver, that, where they've got some... Um, recreations and they're pretty cool and and i'll put pictures of those up on the website at some point my sources for this were um verse by the side of the road by frank rousem jr from 1965 wikipedia for just basic info stuff a trip to the forney museum of transportation and a website uh the national museum of american history and from 2022 i've got my own little jingle i want to share Two guys tell two tales of past regrets and future fails. Dream idiots. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I have to get that printed up into a into a something. Yeah. I, I, I'm thinking that might be a shirt design down the road. Right, right. right. That's uh, pretty good. Dream, dream idiots slash Burma shape. But I, I've always been fascinated with Burma shape signs. And w- whenever I drive along old country roads, I, I just, I'm kind of like, man, what, what if I found this? 
what if I found a road that still had Burma shave signs on it? And I, I know that's not going to happen, but you know, they, they were just a very clever and interesting uh, ad campaign that really took advantage of car culture, right? As we right. for the first time, started, right, right, right. Yeah, and it was just really, really, um, uh, you know, they're fun. I highly recommend the book. I think it's still in print. I think it's still around. But in that book, they list all 600 jingles. It's just pages and pages. Oh, okay, and stuff. yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of groaners in there, but every now and then there's there's a really good one. So, yeah, um, it, it seems like I, I must have had that book as well at some point. I remember, I remember being a kid going through a book that had that had many of them, just page after page of, of just the burn yep. shave lines. Um, I, I it's been a jillion years. I don't, I, I don't, I don't recall any of them now. But so, well, the the popular one is uh, within this veil of toil and sin, your head grows bald, but not your chin. Burma shave. That's <laughs> a right. big one. And what made it interesting was that uh, it was one of those books that was perfectly sized to place on the back of the toilet. Right, right, yeah. If you, just, need, yeah. If you needed right. reading material. Just, you know, four, the, uh, like four by 10, like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, fits, fits perfectly on the back there. So you can just. Yeah, uh, that, that, that was the one we had. Never that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's a brief look at Burma shave signs. That's cool. That's really funny. Awesome. Great job. Thank you, sir. Um, so shifting gears quickly into um something you will you will not guess it's the dream idiots curse word of the week oh no okay. uh, you'll like this you'll enjoy this you won't be able is to this guess where it. you make me is this where are you gonna make me guess something here I'm, I'm, uh, yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you guess guess this word the word is schwafflen it's s-w-a-f-f-e-l-e-n schwafflen it's a verb schwafflen um so it's not it's not english by the way schwaffling schwafflen schwafflen so it sounds german or sounds nordic or german dutch dutch schwafflen um is it is it doing something horrible with a waffle (laughs) no no it's doing it, it is it is doing something horrible but it's not with a waffle Okay, schwafflen. Um, uh, It's when you get extra use out of your underwear by turning it backwards and then inside out for the week. Exactly. Is that what it is? You got it. You're no. (laughs) Oh, uh, all right. (laughs) No, schwafflen, a verb. It is. I don't know why this is a Dutch word. Um, It is to bang your penis against the Taj Mahal. The uh, the Dutch are known for that, huh? I'm not quite sh- quite sure why there'd be a Dutch word for banging your penis against a building that's in India, rather famously. But you know, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, I, I thought I read that in passing and thought, oh, that's funny. I'm so glad I told my friends and neighbors to tune into this podcast. <laughs> I have a highbrow stuff this week on, <laughs> on, 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 on Dream of Hits. Yeah, we're setting the bar high. Intellectual, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> good, good stuff. It, it just, how do, how do, I mean, is this something that people do for like, but, you know, is there any di- context to it? Full disclosure, uh, I, I think the, the, the full story, because I had, I Googled this after I saw this word, like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it is the Dutch word to hit your penis against something or someone. Um, but then apparently some Dutch teenager, actually did it against the Taj Mahal and was arrested. And so there, there became and rightfully this... so. <laughs> <laughs> well, mom, dad, I committed sexual assault. Oh God, what did you do? You know, thinking it's they did something bad to a person. No, I assaulted the a building. Okay. So why, why that would be a word in the first place though? Who, you know, who knows? Okay. There well, you go. I've learned, I've learned something here today. No, we, we, we plant these seeds. We hope they sprout. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so shifting gears here a little bit um i'm going to take a story to you know, take us on a journey back uh into middle part of the 18th century um have you ever heard of the uh transit of venus uh 
I, I've heard the phrase, I think, but I can't place it. And I'm not sure where I would have heard that. Okay. Um, so this is one of those weird uh, historical things that um, I'm always sort of blown away by the fact that, you know, people think conspiracy theorists, extremists think that the world is flat. We have known for hundreds and hundreds of years that the world is round uh, and that for hundreds of years as well, folks that were scientifically minded back, you know, the last 500 years, basically the only, the only people that pursued scientific pursuits were the very, very wealthy because life on earth until pretty much the 20th century or, you know, maybe halfway through the 19th century was, was a, a bit of a shit show. I mean, li literally, you know, there's no, there's no sanitation, there's no antibiotics, there's no, you know, life is rough. And so if you're, you know, an average citizen, living anywhere in the world, just survival is a bit of a, a bit of an issue. Finding your next meal, you know, child dying during childbirth was very, very common. Mm -hmm. Life expectancy couldn't have been, you know, in this is uh, our main character here was, was born in 1725. Average life expectancy then had to have been maybe your thirties. Um, so if you were at all interested in, uh, in science and, you know, gathering data, you basically had to be, uh, the top 1% and, 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 and your life and, and your security was basically guaranteed and you, and you weren't involved in any of these sort of day-to-day -day struggles of, of life. And um, could you imagine, could you imagine that would make us the wise old men of the village? Oh, yeah. Could you imagine yes. those poor people the, who had to deal with the, us as this, right. as the, <laughs> the wizened the elders of the town, right? right. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. No, they're, they're, they're busy whacking their penises against buildings. <laughs> we don't know what they're doing over there. So this is uh, the story of um, Guillaume Le Gentil. So yeah, he is um, a French uh, astronomer. His full name, Guillaume Joseph Hyacinth Jean-Baptiste Le Gentil de la Galissiere. Um, that's a mouthful. Um, that's also in... Brian Eno's full name too. <laughs> really? <laughs> so uh, he's born in 1725. He's born into, um, into wealth. Um, and, uh, he's appointed, you know, he, you know, he grows up you know, later, later on in life, he's appointed to the Royal, Royal Academy of Sciences. Uh, and this is a period of time in human history where, uh, there are some fairly noticeable advances being made in science, considering this is 250 years ago, there are endeavors being made to figure out, uh, aspects of the earth and its nature, how big it is, what, what's its mass, how big around is it? Uh, there were scientists in various countries arguing over, disputing whether or not, you know, is the earth, um, is its circumference the same when you measure equatorial, equatorially versus longitudinally, right? So, and they, you know, they, the, someone put forth, I, I think um, uh, Hubble put forth the, the idea that the earth would have to be stouter around, measured uh, around the equator. So there, there are these scientifically minded people who are pursuing these, these various pursuits. Um, <clears throat> and so um, there is also put forth this, um, this idea that in order to gather some, some quality information that they need to send out um, dozens, it says even hundreds of scientists and astronomers were sent out around the world um, based on this um, idea that was posited by Edmund Halley that if they could um, observe in several locations the transit of Venus, they, they could gather some, some helpful information about the nature of the Earth. So the transit of Venus occurs when Venus basically moves between Earth and the Sun. And so it's basically backlit by the, by the Sun, can be seen. Um, and admittedly, I am not an astronomer. I don't really claim to understand these. I, I know that Mercury and Venus go around the sun much faster than we do. Mercury is like 88 days, I think. Venus is seven months, seven and a half months. And in my completely amateurish viewpoint, I would assume that if Venus goes around uh, the sun in seven and a half months, that it therefore would have to have a transit of the sun every seven and a half months. Um, but that's not true. They figured out well in advance of this gentleman's story that um, that Venus only actually goes across the face of the sun um, 12 years apart. Um, it, it'll happen once, it'll happen again 12 years later, and then it doesn't happen again for 108 years. So it's a very, very infrequent occurrence. Um, 
So they, they decide they're going to send you know scientists out all over the world to uh, observe this event. Uh, and so um, Le Gentil is sent. Um, it, it's very, very beneficial, um, really essential to view these types of events as close to the equator as you possibly can. So he, he boards a ship uh, in the early part of 1761, and he's going to sail to uh, an area called Pondicherry. It's a French possession uh, in India to observe this event. He sets out in March of 1760, uh, reaches what is now basically current day Mauritius only three months later, which is frankly pretty impressive considering this is nearly 300 years ago. Um, but unfortunately, um, one event happens around the same period of time that kind of foils his plans a little bit. The Seven Years' War breaks out between France and, uh, and Britain. So um, he doesn't make it all the way to, um, to Pondicherry. He, um, he, um, in the last, last leg of his voyage to that location, he, they, they come to find out that um, Pondicherry is actually now under British control. And so he's French. He can't land there. So he turns back around to head, head back to where he was in uh, Mauritius. Uh, and um, the first transit that he's planning on seeing in 1761, he unfortunately is blown off course. And they're at sea when the transit actually occurs. Oh. And so it's he's on a boat. He doesn't have any... Um, any equipment, he misses it completely. So he makes and it Google, back. Ma Google Maps is like, turn left, turn left, <laughs> right, turn exactly. left. So he, he finally gets back to um, Isle de France, Mauritius. Uh, and uh, he has missed the transit of Venus. And I'm sure he's probably not thrilled. Um, and all this time, he is sending letters and correspondence back to, to Paris um and uh informs uh his benefactors and his family well you know um missed it this time around i'm just gonna stay put and i'll catch it next time around so this this feels very much like a kardashian thing to do i, I don't you know it's like a weird <laughs> I, I missed opening day of the major league baseball season so i'm just gonna stay in boston until opening day for now you know, i don't understand how this would even make sense surely you sail home if it only takes three months Anyway, he stays put uh, where he is in Mauritius, and he's going to wait around for it to come back around uh, in 1769. So hangs, Mauritius apparently is beautiful, hangs out at the beach um, and um, you know, prepares for uh, this next, uh, next time it's, it's coming around. Um, builds his own little, you know, on his own, builds his own little small um, observatory. And um, just, you know, spends his time there, uh, you know, in preparation for this event. Um, the, the day does finally um, roll around. Um, apparently that morning he had um, had breakfast with like, the, you know, basically the, the provincial governor of the area. Uh, and very, very excited to see, see this transit uh, and returns to his observ observatory and um it's cloudy all day and <laughs> nothing um and it is reported after the fact that he was so livid he didn't say a word to anybody for two weeks um i was you know picturing him you know not saying you know, being very very stoic and not saying anything for a while and then when he's finally left left alone having this string of profanity coming out of his mouth in french as he completely destroys his observatory <laughs> Having but a basil faulty meltdown, yeah, yeah, just, just totally know, loses. God, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> All the stuff being broken behind, behind a locked door, um, and so he sees nothing. Well, the next transit of Venus is 108 years away, so okay, I guess I need to return to France. Um, so he boards a ship uh, bound for France. Um, the comedy of errors only seek only then um, continues. Because the ship is caught in a storm, it is blown off course for a period of time, and then the entire ship gets dysentery. Uh, so the shit show continues um, all the way home. Um, at some point, I, I read in the notes that they didn't even take him all the way. They dropped him off at, at one point. So his return trip takes like two and a half years, where the, where the outbound trip is three months. Blown off course, get, gets dropped off somewhere in northern um, Africa at one point. Finally, finally, finally makes it all the way back to the coast of France. It, and I just, um, you know, imagine 
he's been gone now for, I think, a total of 11 years. Um, and I mentioned the Seven Years' War. So all this correspondence that he'd been sending back all of this time, um, the overwhelming majority of it didn't make it back. So while he's been gone, uh, his wife had him declared dead and she remarried. And his entire estate, which was considerable, was plundered by his family because <laughs> he's oh. presumed, presumed to be dead. So lands on the coast of, of France. And, and on top you know, of all of that, Euro Disney was closed that week. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, gets, <laughs> gets, like, gets off a ship somewhere, um, I presume, on that northern coast, northwest coast, you know, reasonably close to England. And someone seeing him for the first time and, you know, uh, Monsieur Le Gentil, we, we're, well, we're very surprised to see you. Let me <laughs> <laughs> How was your trip? Okay, this it's not awkward at all. Um, let me gallop ahead to, to Paris and let your wife know. She'll be very surprised as well. Um, so he apparently you know, returns to Paris um, and all of his stuff is gone. I mean, I just... Uh, I mean, and he had a sufficiently high level of wealth that I'm sure he had, you know, all kinds of fabulous things that have since been sold, broken, plundered, whatever. Um, I mean, he probably had a Keurig, right? Um, <laughs> but made it back. Um, and, you know, I judge he managed to rebuild his life reasonably, reasonably well, made some contributions to astronomy going forward for the rest of his life. He did live another 20 years. You know, if the, if the average life expectancy at the time was was certainly under 40. Um, he did live, live to be uh, over 70. Um, wow. there, are some, there are some pretty cool drawings of, of him and his you know, pencil drawings in his hand of, um, of the Orion Nebula. Uh, so definitely made some you know, notable contributions from that point on. But this was a classic example of um, a comedy of errors trip for this poor guy. Oh. So there comes you have it. Ba com comes back. And his relatives have put the little green, orange, and pink dots on the things they want in his house. Uh, yes, huh? Oh, Brian, I've never heard of this guy. That was, it's, that was amazing. Yeah, fairly amusing. The um, there actually is uh, apparently there's a a playwright um in Canada named Maureen Hunter who made uh, who wrote a play about him. Um, so it's, it's it's been produced a couple times in Canada. And then also that play was also also adapted into an opera. Uh, and it's been, you know, put on at least twice, both times in Canada. So just a couple of quick questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the 12, 12, 108 years, the differences between the two, what accounts for that? Is it, is it because but, you're dealing with the earth moving? Is that like a classic, what they call the three body problem, where you've got three bodies in space and they're all rotating around each other and that kind of stuff? Is that what, is that what I, accounted I for the weird... I genuinely don't, don't know. I mean, I, I know enough about astronomy to know that, that all the planets in our solar system, their orbits around the sun are all, are all essentially in the same plane. I mean, I think they're exactly in the same plane. And so in my, you know, third grade astronomer mind, that says to me that Venus would have to go across the sun every single time. I, I, so I don't, I, don't, I don't understand why, why it would be uh, this little gap. Then, but, you know, it happens twice. Because it happened in, apparently happened in 2004 and then in 2012, but then what happened again in our lifetime? Or will, no. Um, so uh, you, why, I mean, A, I, I'm blown away by how with 300 year old technology, they, I mean, they knew about this well in advance of this transit. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. How, how they figured that out. I mean, it's just mind blowing to me that this was information that, that these minds were able to discern at this time in the first place. Um, but still, I mean, someone could, someone very knowledgeable could explain it to me and I still wouldn't get it probably. So, so why is, why is there this, you know, gap between the two and why is it then 108 years until it happens again? I don't know. So if we have any folks that are expert in three body problems and astronomy, let us know. That'd be great because yeah. I want that. Um, th a few more observations, uh, from the department of jokes I should have made. Transit of <laughs> Venus, what I should have said was, isn't that the Tangerine Dream's first album? <laughs> right. <laughs> Two, what was the name of the university that he went to? Oh, I didn't what mention university. He was uh, Royal was Academy of Science. Yeah, they have a hell of a football team. <laughs> Rose Bowl, the fight and slide rules of... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, and then finally, <laughs> just not, not stupid, there's a really great restaurant in Houston called Pondicherry. 
it's off Kirby and it's great. It's like a new Indian fusion. And oh, really? that's the first thing. Yeah. Oh, really? yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, God. And it's never, never so heard of it. good. Huh. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that whenever we go back to Houston, we're like, on a journey. Um, so, wow. Great story, man. Thanks. That was that's something else. Good, good times. Yeah, it, may, it makes my the summer of my discontent look like nothing. That poor schlub. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> Feel lucky now, don't you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. All right. Well, there we go. A story about advertising and a story about a guy who was really trying to do something cool and got the short end. Life of the conspired stick. against him. There you go. The guy. Um, so visit uh, dreamidiots.com. You, you can email us, dreamidiotspodcast at gmail. Um, if genuinely, if someone can explain that whole transit of Venus thing and, and wants to share, you know, we'll happily post that. If anyone wants to you know, pass that along, um, we'll happily share that and we'll be back again soon. And you can even address it, dear idiots, here's how it works. All right. See you next time. Bye.